Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our online briefing series about rural communities, climate, and COVID-19 recovery. I'm Dan Bursett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, we have had a great run of panelists uh, this week, and that continues today. In just a few minutes, we will learn about how rural communities can rise to the challenge of dual disasters, in particular, the coronavirus outbreak and severe flooding. Our briefing mini-series kicked off Tuesday with a look at how rural electric cooperatives help their members lower their energy bills through energy efficiency delivered as part of on-bill financing programs. Yesterday, our topic was the bioeconomy's role in COVID-19 recovery and climate solutions. If you missed us on Tuesday or yesterday, you can visit www.esi.org. There you will find an archived webcast and presentation materials. And when you do, take a moment to sign up for our Climate Change Solutions newsletter, which is a great way to stay informed about our briefing and receive our fact sheets and other educational resources. The goal of this briefing series is to raise awareness of the impacts of climate change on rural areas in the context of the coronavirus outbreak. Every state has been touched by the pandemic so far, but the incidence of the virus seems to be on the rise in places like Arkansas, Iowa, South Carolina, and other rural places. If this trend continues, it could not come at a worse time for emergency preparedness officials. Over the past several years in particular, summer months have brought increasingly severe and, natural and frequent natural disasters like flooding. Rural communities already face unique challenges in preparing for floods and maintaining adequate infrastructure. For example, local governments with small staff often do not have the capacity to apply for disaster preparedness funding and can be left out of valuable federal programs. Yesterday, one of our panelists mentioned the difficult time many rural hospitals are facing. Imagine how much harder treating patients is when a severe flood hits, when other emergency responders are stretched to the limit and facilities are at capacity with those sick from the novel coronavirus. This briefing will characterize these issues in the context of COVID-19, but we will not stop at describing the problems and challenges. As usual, we will do our best during this briefing to highlight solutions these rural communities are implementing to solve those problems and meet and overcome those challenges. Our online briefing is part of this Rural Issues mini-series, but like most of what we do at EESI, it fits into a broader picture of climate change solutions. Some of you were perhaps in attendance a few months ago, back in February, when we hosted a briefing about coastal resilience efforts in communities around the Great Lakes. We heard at that briefing about how dairy farms are adapting to a changing environment, as well as the role that tribal organizations play and identifying and implementing solutions that are respectful to their long tradition of environmental stewardship. There'll be some overlap today between that briefing and our discussion, so I encourage anyone interested to visit www.esi.org and watch that archived webcast and refer to those presentation materials, and perhaps we'll get a question or two from our viewers that will help tie things together. Speaking of questions, because we are online once again today, I cannot call on you if you have a question. So please follow EESI on Twitter at EESI online and send in your questions that way. You can also send an email to EESI at EESI.org. We will draw from your question submissions after we hear from our panelists. Our first panelist is Dick Norton. Dick is a professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Michigan's Tubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. He also holds a joint appointment as a professor in the program in the environment at University of Michigan's College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Dick teaches and conducts research in the areas of planning law, sustainable development, land use and environmental planning, and coastal area management. His most recent research has focused on the challenges of man managing shorelines along the, uh, along the Great Lakes. Dick, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Hello, Dan. Thanks for having me. I'm very glad to be here. Can you hear me okay? This is a quick mic check. Yep. Okay, good. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I was asked to speak. Let me call this up. Can you see that okay? Uh, yep, okay. looks good. 
We're good. Okay. Uh, thanks for asking me. I'm here. I'm going to talk about um, the challenges of small planning for small town and rural communities, particularly with regard to infrastructure and disasters. And and what I have to say really covers the whole country. But I'll I'll draw examples um, from my own backyard in Michigan, which is is what I know best. So I'm going to move quickly. I'm going to give kind of a larger picture overview of things that are going on, and then happy to answer more specific questions if I can uh, during the Q and A. Okay, so just to give a quick thumbnail history, um, to, to make the point that since about the 1860s, we've kind of inverted. Our population has grown pretty dramatically um, uh, from being mostly rural with lots of many smaller farms and market towns and a few cities to now predominantly urban. That transition happened at about the 1910s, 1920s, where we were about 50-50. So in the 1860s, our population was about 80% rural. Today, it's a little bit less than 20% rural. So more folks live in rural settings today than in the 1860s, but as a proportion of the um, population in the country, there are less rural dwellers. At the same time, we have seen rural land development um, um, go down or the rural uses of land go down as we've urbanized and done other things so that today roughly about 75 percent of the landscape in the lower 48 states is um, is considered rural and, and what's replaced that largely are cities exurban cities suburbs uh, exurbia which is more rural residential development and then even in rural lands we've seen a transition to fewer larger farms compared to the many small farms that we had back in the late 1800s. So there is this transition taking place and it's had a real effect on the landscape. Um, here's to give an example from, my, again, my own backyard. This is the city of Grand Haven and Grand Haven Charter Township. And I'm hoping you all can see that pointer. That's the city of Grand Haven. These are located on the uh, lake, uh, uh, shores of Lake Michigan on the western side of the state. Um, the city is right there. And then this area is the larger township. So this is just to illustrate um, that the both, both jurisdictions, if you will, have about the same population, but the density of the population in the city is quite a bit larger, about three persons per acre, um, compared to the township, was, which is less than a person per acre. And the parcel sizes are correspondingly much larger in the township. So there is definitely some agriculture taking place in the in the township, but there are also, there's a lot of rural residential development, kind of more exurban development, kind of spreading out into the into the uh, landscape. So, given all of that, um, rural areas uh, experience some ongoing challenges that have been going on for a while, and, and perhaps are getting a little bit worse. Um, uh, challenges that are related to the business of farming, um, uh, given global. Um, trade patterns and such, it's getting harder to farm and to engage in forestry. Um, there are environmental challenges. Um, rural land uses, particularly farming and forestry, can be environmentally benign or even environmentally beneficial, but they can also be hugely environmental polluting if they're not done well. And so there's a lot of pressure to try and work with agriculture and forestry to do a better job of stewarding the environment. There are real demographic pressures um, confronting rural places right now as, as um, younger folks move out of the countryside into the cities. Uh, the, the populace of farmers is uh, the age, average age of farmers are getting older. They don't maybe have younger generations to hand their farms off to. So um, the demographics they're getting making continuing farming and rural land use is more difficult. Correspondingly, there are increasing urban pressures as rural residents move into rural settings. Um, they bring with them the desire to not smell manure being spread um, um, during the during the season, and so there are increasing conflicts with rural land uses and and those kind of urban rural um, land use patterns. And then similarly, um, urbanization pressures in the form of land prices as uh, as urban development etches out for more and more into the countryside, that pushes up land prices, making it harder to stay viable as a, a farming or forestry operation. And then just in general, rural areas um, uh, uh, suffer from a higher incidence of poverty, unemployment, and increased um, disabilities in the terms of the population. And they enjoy somewhat less um, opportunities for educational activities and, and lower diverse in general. So there are some, our rural areas in the country are really taking it on the chin right now in a lot of ways, which so makes challenging quite challenging to plan for them, um, particularly from hazards. And then in terms of planning for rural, um, two particular challenges, especially in the context of infrastructure and disasters, and I'm gonna group them into scale problems and politics culture problems. 
in terms of scale, what this really boils down to is, is we provide roads and water and stormwater and broadband service. It's just more expensive to have to provide it when the population is more spread out. If you're having to build three times as much pipeline to serve the same number of residents, it costs three times as much to provide that services. And that plays out for, for services as well, police, fire, emergency, hazard response. So, so the more that we're seeing exurban development and, and folks coming into these rural areas that want to have more urban-like services, it's getting more difficult and more expensive to provide those services just because of scale problems. That really con, uh, con creates fiscal problems. And then similarly, in terms of governance, um, rural areas still encompass the great bulk of the land area of the country, but they're increasingly smaller parts of the population. And so it's very difficult to have the bandwidth, the capacity, if you will, to, to administer government, do good analysis, do good planning. So there's a real capacity problem to deal with the issues that we're trying to deal with in these rural settings. And then in terms of politics and culture, the planning for rural is complicated. Um, nobody, I can assure you, in, the, in this country really likes government. Nobody likes regulation. Everybody believes in property rights and individualism. I think it's fair to say that's a bit more um, uh, true in rural settings where, where you're living out in places where it's a little bit harder to see how your use of your land area or the infrastructure you're building and wanting to use is having an effect on your neighbors. And so that makes accepting regulation a bit more difficult and the notion of private property a bit stronger. So there's some political cultural pushback against dealing with the problems we're dealing with in terms of infrastructure uh, and, and disasters just because of that rural culture. Um, so let me give you a case study. This is the, the floods that just happened in the state a couple weeks ago. So if you see my pointer, that's the lower peninsula of Michigan, that's Midland um, and some communities above it. This is a very small town rural part of the state. And we had some major rain events in May that culminated in um, a dam failure. So this is the Edenville Dam. Somebody caught it just as it was giving way. Um, so there's a gr great video on MLive.com that shows it fail. And huge pour, uh, water comes pouring out. There was a dam below that, the Sanford Dam, that then gave way because it was overwhelmed by the floodwaters coming down. Um, that had the effect of draining Wixom Lake, which was what Edenville Dam was holding. It washed away a bunch of roads and other infrastructure, and it flooded a good bit of the uh, town of Midland, which was below that. So here's a catastrophic dam failure in a, in a small town rural setting that had a huge impact. Let me give you some numbers. So in this one instance, two dams failed, 10,000 people had to be evacuated, 3,700 properties were damaged, some 2,300 homes were damaged, apparently only 14% of which had flooding insurance. That accumulated to about $190 million in economic losses to property owners in the state, $55 million in response costs and infrastructure damage from one, that one instance alone. So we have in the state of Michigan about 2,500 dams statewide. Only about half of those are regulated. And for the whole state of Michigan, we have a grand total of two dam inspectors, safety dam inspectors for the state. And, and uh, I've heard that we have about five other dams, at least that are in critical condition that could face a similar kind of failure problem uh, if we get the right storm event. So there's some reason to be concerned. So where do we go from here? How do we rise to the challenge? Planners who are th worried about sustainability and adaptable communities and landscapes really focus on let's keep rural places rural keep working landscapes working, farm and forestry by making sure that agricultural is economically vi viable um, and forestry is viable. Let's make it resilient. Let's try and build away from hazards and not um, build in floodplains. Let's keep it economically resilient by diversifying the agricultural activities that are going, make them environmentally green, maybe make them more amenity based so that folks um, who aren't consuming the resource but wanna be there are contributing to the economic well-being of that rural setting. The small towns within these areas, let's keep them compact. It's much more efficient to provide infrastructure and provide the kinds of services and the kind of small town fuel that you wanna have. If you keep those communities, small communities, again, build them out of hazard way or try and move them out of hazards way if they're in floodplains and such. And then keep the economies of those small towns, especially locally focused with, for example, community supported agriculture those kinds of activities. And then finally, in urban places, that's where you want the density. Again, make them <laughs> resilient to hazards, but they can be more focused on global economy. So there's a place for all of these different kinds of developments to happen across the landscape in the country. 
That leads though to new kinds of challenges that we're facing. We're facing a new normal. Climate change is happening. I know that's a politically loaded statement, but it's happening and we have to deal with it. In rural settings, there it's easier to have disconnects. It's a little bit harder to see how the activity that you're engaging in could be having larger impacts on the system. But the larger systems, the infrastructure systems, the natural systems, the coastal systems I work with, are, are dying a, a death by a thousand cuts. All of these little changes we're making are adding up cumulatively, and we don't see it happening because it's happening so gradually. So that's boiling frogs. Environmentalists like to say, when when what's happening so gradually, frogs don't know they're being boiled because they're just not aware of what's going on. So that's a huge challenge for us. Um, I think we're really dealing with some serious political polarization in this country that's making it much harder to sit down at the table and calmly talk through what are the issues here and how do we deal with them. We do seem to be chasing one size fits all silver bullet solutions that I would call landscape dumb. And in there, at the really basic level, it's either government needs to fix all of this or we absolutely need no government at all to do anything, get it out of the way. Well, neither of those are really good solutions. We need to start tailoring what we're doing. Having said that, I think we are underinvesting in government. I I'm just appalled that we only have two inspectors for the whole state of Michigan, and we have a thousand dams we should be inspecting regularly to make sure that they're still safe. You get what you pay for. We're not really paying what we need to be paying to get the kind of government we need to do good jobs. We're also building unfortunate policy expectations. If we go back in every time a community floods out and say, we're gonna rebuild you back to exactly the way you were and not take stock of the fact that there could be another flood tomorrow that could wipe all of that out again. We're creating bad expectations about living with the environment. And then finally, a huge big challenge is loss aversion. It's really hard for people to give up what they've had sometimes even to the point that they know it would be the right thing to do, but still I just can't, I, I can't give up having this, this, this home that I've lived in forever. And, and that's totally understandable. It's a real challenge. Where do we go with this? Well, we need to start encouraging participation in government and decision-making before the storm happens and not wait till after it happens. And that's a challenge, but we need to start working on better ways to do that. We need to promote good government, good governance, not big government, not small government, but get government to do what we need government to do and make sure it's doing it well. We need to adopt better landscape smart policies that fit the setting that we're working in, the natural systems, and we need to also adopt no regret policies, policies where even if climate change doesn't work out to be as bad as we thought it might, still the things we've adopted make great good sense and they've helped us make for better communities. So there are lots of things we could do along those lines. And I think I, our next speaker will talk about some of that. And then we need to learn to live with nature better. Instead of trying to fight nature to every last thread, we need to figure out sometimes how to relocate or adapt to where we're living given the natural systems we're in, and then maybe engineer as a last resort. And finally, we need to be developing better stewardship economies. We need to figure out how to really steward and cultivate and manage our rural settings, especially so that they will continue to thrive and provide us with the food support and the life support systems that we need and, and really expect out of our, our rural settings. So those are all big picture things that we need to be doing. And again, my goal here was to kind of set the framework for how to uh, address these challenges. And then the final thing I'll just say about COVID-19 is that's just made it all that much harder to do everything we're doing because it's so much harder for folks to get together and deliberate and, and collaborate in the way that we really need to be engaging. So that's just added a whole lot of complication to that. So that's my really quick spin through of my presentation and I'll stop here and then look forward to questions during the question and answer period. Great. Thanks, Dick. That was a great presentation. Uh, and we will definitely have time for questions. Um, if anyone joined us a little late and maybe missed part of Dick's presentation, just as a reminder, um, you can visit uh, www.esi.org for an archived webcast as well as presentation materials. Um, after our next speaker, we will have some questions. And if you have those questions, you can get them to us a couple different ways. The first is by following us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, and the email address to use is eesi at eesi.org. Now on to our second panelist. Steve Samuelson is National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator at the Kansas Department of Agriculture in the Division of Water Resources. Serving citizens of Kansas at the Division of Water Resources, Steve has worked uh, in that capacity since 2007. Steve was a local community flood plain manager in Lyon County, Kansas, prior to working for the state. Steve is a committee chair for the Association of State Floodplain Managers, and he graduated from Emporia State University in 1982. 
Steve, welcome to the briefing today. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. I hope you can hear me and see my screen. So you, I'm a flood guy from Kansas, and that's why you're looking at a map of Kansas right now. And this map of Kansas has some white areas on it. Those white areas are counties that do not now, nor have they ever had a flood map created for them by the federal government. The National Flood Insurance Program has existed since 1968, and in over half a century, no flood maps have been made for large portions of the country. The Association of State Floodplain Managers has a white paper called Mapping the Nation, it's recommended reading. Now, one of my challenges in helping rural communities in Kansas is that I've got citizens who don't believe they have flood risk. And the reason they don't believe they have flood risk is because the federal government has never made them a flood map. I also have citizens that believe they do have flood risk and they want to mitigate that flood risk. But it's very difficult to mitigate the flood risk without the flood information associated with a flood map. And if you were to look at a map of Kansas showing the COVID-19 cases across the state, you would see something similar where there would be areas shaded in and areas not shaded in. I have rural communities that by their nature of being small and isolated, they haven't had their first COVID case in their town yet. Because they haven't had a case in town yet, they don't think they're at risk. So there's a tendency to believe that you don't have risk until the information is kind of shoved in your face, I guess you're gonna say. And I'm gonna talk about small towns because that's what they suggested that I speak about. And one of the issues is gonna be that as I'm giving this little speech, everybody listening to me is gonna have a different opinion about what a small town is. I bet there's people listening to me right now that think that a small town is 10,000 people. You might be surprised to know that I often work with cities of less than 100 people. I'm relieved when I go to a town that has 500 people because I know they'll have at least a full-time paid city clerk. So there'll be somebody there for me to talk to so I don't have to call the mayor at night at home when he gets off work. So, this, so just deciding what a small town means may be a challenge in dealing with these things. And small towns have limited staff, so everybody wears multiple hats. One of my, one of my emergency management directors who does the floodplain management for her community is also a trained nurse. She's had to step aside from her floodplain management duties to deal with COVID-19 entirely. She found somebody to fill her role. He's the county appraiser, and he knows nothing about floodplain management. He seems like a nice man. He seems earnest. I think he's going to try hard but he's never taken a training class on floodplain management so that he knows exactly what to do. Uh, in this situation, I've just told him when something comes up, you call me and I'll walk you through it. And we had a lot of rain in Kansas in 2019 and a lot of places got flooded. Small towns that most of y'all never heard about. Places like Elmdale with a population of 50. Durham is a town of 110. The diner downtown on Main Street had, had about three feet of water in it. Peabody got flooded and Strong City got flooded. I'm gonna focus in on Strong City a little bit. Strong City got flooded three times. Got flooded in May, got flooded in June, and got flooded in July. And in spite of all that flooding, they never saw anybody from FEMA, and not one of their citizens ever got a dime from FEMA. Because you'd have to flood about 100 small towns in Kansas all at the same time from the same event to meet the dollar requirements for a presidential disaster declaration. So these communities aren't getting presidential disaster declarations. They're not getting the mitigation dollars that are associated with a disaster declaration. I've worked for the Kansas Department of Agriculture since August 2007. In all those years, not one of my citizens has ever gotten individual assistance from a disaster declaration. We have had disaster declarations to communities for roads and infrastructure for public assistance, but not to individuals. Strong City is a town of 583 people. They have a highway that runs into town, Highway 177. It's got this culvert under it. On the north side of the highway, there's houses. On the south side of the highway, there's a stream. Well, when it rains on the south side of the highway, the stream overtops its banks, water backs up through the culverts, goes towards those houses to the north. They solve that problem by closing a gate on the culvert. When it rains on the north side of the highway, they open that gate wide up, the water flows through the culvert under the highway and into the stream and is carried away and the houses don't flood. The problem arises when it rains on both sides of the highway at the same time. When that happens, the volunteer fire department, unpaid volunteers, come out there in the middle of the night, set up a pump and pump water across the road and close the highway. Strong City asked for a mitigation grant, put in a small floodproof pump house right here near this culvert where they could pump water under the road and not have to close the highway. One person could go there and flip a switch. You wouldn't need a crew from the volunteer fire department. That would, that would help protect those houses and keep the road open. Unfortunately, 
when they applied for their mitigation grant, the grant was denied. You see, when you apply for a mitigation grant, there are very good reasons why you have to have a cost to benefit analysis. You have to prove that for every dollar you're gonna spend, you're gonna have $1 in losses avoided. Unfortunately, Strong City has done a wonderful job of avoiding losses. So they didn't have a history of homes being flooded thanks to that volunteer fire department and those, the hard work those guys have done. So the fact that they've done a good job has meant that their grant was denied. Someday their truck will malfunction or their, their pump will fail and the houses will flood. And at that point, we'll qualify for a mitigation grant. But it seems a shame we have to let the houses flood before we can do that. And you have to remember small, small cities like Strong City, town of 583 people, does not have a grant writer on staff, does not have an engineer on staff. In fact, the staff in Strong City is three people, Shree, Yvonne, and, and Matt. Now, they've got three people there, but those three people do a wonderful job of living up to their responsibilities in their National Flood Insurance Program. National Flood Insurance Program makes flood insurance disaster assistance to individuals and mitigation grants available in the community in exchange the community manages the flood plans. So when they had those floods, this, they put out this little flashing sign out there on the main road that says, hey everybody, you have to get flood plane permits before you repair your flood damage and substantial damage determinations will be done. And because Long City does a good job of managing their flood plains, they've joined a FEMA program called the Community Rating System. Community rating system rewards the community with flood insurance discounts based on a rating of how well they're doing managing their flood plans to reduce flood risk. It's a good program, but unfortunately it's heavily rated towards bigger cities. Small towns have a hard time joining CRS. When you join the community rating system or CRS, you have to have computer generated geographic information systems mapping, GIS maps. And Strong City doesn't have a GIS department. So my staff and I make all of the CRS maps for all the rural communities that want to join the CRS program in the state of Kansas. And I say my staff and I, it's two of us, myself and one other person. And uh, we get funding through a program that, called the Community Assistance Program, State Support Services Element. And uh, because of that program, that program funds two people, I have 732 incorporated cities and unincorporated counties in the state of Kansas. So two people are meeting all the floodplain management needs and giving all the advice and all the help we can to 732 communities all at the same time. We're stretched a little thin. I don't take vacations, I work hundreds of hours of overtime and I still don't meet the need. There's more need than I can meet. We have a program called the Cooperating Technical Partners Program. That program we're using to do watershed wide studies in areas all across the state. And you'll notice many of these watershed studies are in those same areas that don't have maps. So we engineers under contract through the CTP partnership program, the engineers use good LIDAR topography compared with two-dimensional modeling to create base level engineering of where the floodplains should be and how deep the water will be. When my Kansas Division of Emergency Management is applying for a grant under hazard mitigation assistance, they come to us and ask us for this base level engineering so they can use that data in their grant applications because there's no flood maps in these areas to use for anything else. It's the best available information. Under that CTP agreement, we have a little bit of money set aside for technical assistance. The way technical assistance works is that we have, mon we have engineers already on contract. They're making flood maps, they're doing studies. Well, they can program into their study a hypothetical flood control project, run the modeling, and see how it would reduce flooding in a community. Maybe somebody wants to put in a bigger culvert to see if that would reduce flooding to homes near that certain stretch of the road. We could model that for them. This is a screenshot of the town of Sun City. Sun City is a town of 48 people. In Sun City, they, they got flooded last year. Our engineers are Doing a base, are doing, using their base level engineering to do technical assistance in, in this town. And they're gonna come up with a report at the end of this month and it's gonna include recommendations. Recommendations will probably be a pond at the upper left portion of this photograph or a berm at the upstream end of town to help reroute some of the water. The community can take our engineering that we're gonna to give to them for free and use that in a grant application to apply for a grant under hazard mitigation assistance. There's several programs there. And if they get approved for a grant, they probably still won't be able to build the project because you have to have a local match when you do a grant. 
and Sun City is a town of 48 people with limited resources and virtually no funding for the match. Now that horrible looking thing is in Anderson County. It's a dam near the town of Garnett. And it didn't fail, like, like Dick was just talking about in Michigan, thank you. And, uh, but we do have a dam safety program. And one of the best ways to mitigate problems is prevent them from happening. So we have engineers that work in our dam safety program, and we have four of them in the state of Kansas. And they go out and inspect high hazard dams. Well, our dam safety grant was cut this year by 10%. So their entire travel budget for the coming year is $630. We have $630 to pay for the gas and the trucks to go out and inspect all of the high hazard dams across the state that we need to look at next year. Now they told me there'd be federal people on the line. So I've talked about some federal programs and how we use them to help small towns in Kansas because small towns in Kansas can't really do it on their own if they're too small. They just don't have the resources. Some of them are barely squeaking by. Quite frankly, we had a flood map meeting in a town with a levy called Barnard, and they just said, we can't afford to certify our levy, and we might as well just give up now because our town is probably gonna be unincorporated within a short period of years. So small towns can't do it on their own, so we use programs through the state of Kansas to help support our small towns. And now I'm going to stop talking and start listening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve, for your presentation. Um, well, uh, you'll have lots of opportunity for, for, to continue talking um, because we're starting to get questions and we're going to pivot now to, to questions and answers. Um, really excellent presentation and um, uh, lots of really interesting insight. Um, we are going to, like I said, transition to questions. Um, we've started getting some from our audience. Thank you very much. Uh, if you would like to submit a question, follow us on Twitter at EESI Online, or you can send us an email, EESI at EESI Online. But now is the time when uh, I step aside and introduce my colleague, Ellen Vaughn. Um, Ellen uh, works uh, on all manner of resilience issues at EESI, and she is going to kick off our Q and A, the Q and A portion. Um, of our time together today. So Ellen, welcome to the briefing and um, I'll, uh, I'll be standing by. Great, thank you, Dan. And uh, hello, Steve and Richard, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I have a lot of, you guys have a lot on your plate. So um, just thank you for what you're doing and um, sharing some of this with us. Um, one of the things that um, struck me, I think, with both of your uh, presentations was just, um, you know, obviously kind of just the lack of resources. It could be staffing. It could be um, mapping tools. Um, and um, I'm wondering if, uh, if you could expand on that a little bit in terms of what might be helpful to have from um, like a FEMA grant for pre-disaster mitigation um, if, if there are some some things for capacity building um, that would be particularly helpful like for broadband infrastructure um, again mapping tools um, that type of thing I guess this could be for either one of you I'll speak up first. So I don't know the whole country. I just know Kansas. All right. But I've got places in Kansas where they don't have good internet service. They can't get business to come to town because they don't have good internet service. That's an, that's an infrastructure issue. At the same time, farming practices are changing. You need more land to make a living on than you used to when my granddad was farming. Okay. And as farms get bigger, populations get smaller. So populations in rural areas are dwindling. That means they have less tax base and less resources there. So, so how do you how do you solve that? I mean, that's a, that's a broad question. Of saying how do we grow the economy in rural areas? Because if we grow their economy, then they'll have means. But through the through your part of the question about mitigation grants, I'd almost like to see something in the language for the various HMA grants you mentioned, PDM or BRIC. What if there was something in there that said this percentage, one percent, two percent, pick a number of this grant program should be used for rural communities, communities of a certain size. And again, pick a number, 1,000 people, 2,000 people, whatever. 
if you did something like that, at least they'd get a piece of the pie. They may not get all of it. And hopefully that there would be enough towns out there for that small piece of the pie that they would have the local ability to manage a grant like that. And again, grant management is an issue when you don't have any paid staff. Some of my towns, the city clerk is a retired person who volunteers and works for free. And so they would have to take on the responsibility to manage a grant. So maybe if the grant programs included more allowance for communities to hire grant managers as part of the program. Interesting. I know some, some folks were also uh, thinking that it would be helpful to have uh, those, that funding uh, eligibility for um, like, you know, training and, and hiring code officials, for example, so that you could, you could have, or yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how you hire code officials in a town where the mayor's not paid. Right. Okay. Good point. So, and this, goes, this goes back to your definition of small towns. I've, I've got towns that's with like 10,000 people, 5,000 people, and they have code officials on staff. Yeah. We, Absolutely. I'll, I'll jump in too if I uh, can make an observation that um, kind of coming back. I know everybody thinks the solution to every problem is to throw more money at it. And that may sound a little bit like this, but I think we're greatly under investing in in all of our economies, especially rural economies. And if we continue to decide we don't want to pay any taxes at all, period, full stop, no government, um, all of the things that both Steve and I have been talking about is the need for more resources for government officials to serve their communities the way that they need to be served. And so instead of, uh, I, I'm absolutely not arguing that we need big government or that, we, or that um, you know, government should be doing everything, but we need to have enough government with enough resources and enough trained folks who know what they're doing to make it work the way it needs to work. And I, I think we've gone a bit too far on the pendulum swing to this starve the beast idea, and we need to get back to let's invest in our communities and, and provide the resources. And it's not just um, technical tools. In my world, everybody is wanting to develop the new toolkit um, that they can put on the web that local officials can pick up and use. And the reality is you still need to have people at the local level who know how to use them. You still need to have base folks with basic training and how to do the GIS things that Steve was talking about, how to write <coughs> grant applications and such. And, and you can maybe do some of that at the county level <coughs> and kind of share those resources down. But maybe you need to better support um, actual local officials who can do that kind of work in house. So um, we need to start changing our mindset for, away from all government is bad to let's invest in government the right way to, to provide the resources we need to really thrive and kind of rethink how we're doing, uh, doing our communities. And Steve mentioned it's getting harder to farm because of the economics of farming, the need to get big equipment to farm larger farm fields. But it's also the case, I think, I can fairly say that a lot of our policies really favor, they don't, they're don't. they not supporting small farmers. They're really designed to promote the larger corporate farming systems. Well, you get what you support. So if we want to support a diverse rural economy that provides more employment for small farmers, we probably need to be rethinking our federal and state policies in a way that really support that and cultivate it instead of kind of keep pushing towards um, big corporate farming. And I'm not, I don't mean to shoot at big corporate farmers. I understand the pressures they're under, but, but we need to kind of step back and rethink carefully the policies that we're adopting and what effect that's having on who's participating in the economy. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and Richard, you also mentioned, um, you know, you need not just the tools, but you need the people, you need the, the human resources uh, with the skills to do th this work. Um, are there um, examples that you, either one of you can think of that, um, that there's a real need for in terms of skills training? Um, in, in your community, I ask this because we're, you know, we're, we're thinking about um, this whole issue of workforce development and just what would be um, maybe uh, most helpful in that regard. Yeah, maybe, maybe Steve, if you don't mind, I'll start off with this and then you build off of what I say. So this is also going to sound like I'm preaching for hiring planners, but the reason I got into planning was because I recognized the kinds of skills you need to do, the kind of work we're talking about is really done well in, in urban and regional planning programs. So in my work in coastal communities, most of which are small towns and very rural, 
the really important skill sets are being able to work with GIS, geographic information systems, um, where you can pull together a lot of data and make a lot of sense out of what's happening here. You need to be able to work with census data and know um, population trends. You need to know landscape data, all of that coming together. So that those are the technical skills that people need to have to understand the, the ground that they're working on, so to speak. And then the other skill set you need is to develop the ability to work with people and to not come in and tell them, here's what you need to do. I'm the trained planner and I know best and you have to do what I want to do. You need to figure out how to be able to sit down at a table with everybody from the community or a good number of them who are coming to the table with different no thoughts on what we ought to be doing and how to approach it and be able to facilitate some good dialogue. So that's maybe more of a soft technical skill. And I can tell Steve's got it. I mean, he's got that ability to kind of talk common sense and get people together. So we need to cultivate that kind of training. And you just can't do that through an online platform. You can't create another tool, put it up on the web and think that communities are gonna pick it up and do something with it without having that kind of assistance. So, so whether it's planners or maybe public administrators, um, having those kinds of people working skills and then the GIS technical analysis skills, putting, bringing those together would go a long way to helping out. Thank you. That's, that, that's very interesting because that um, sort of the saw skill you mentioned came up in some previous briefings we had uh, in this series. It's just you can't <clears throat> uh, say too much about the importance of that in addition to the technical skills. So um, thank you for raising that. Steve, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, my wife does GIS for a living, so she'd appreciate uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's but, but to do GIS, you need, you need a license and you need a computer. Those things cost money. Uh, one of my towns I was talking to recently, their entire budget for streets for the coming year is $6,000. So, yeah, okay. So they're probably not going to invest in GIS right now. Again, rural communities, small resources. You yeah. get a little bigger, yeah, yeah, you can. It all depends on what your definition of small and rural is. Right. Um, I know there are some coming in. I had one more, Dan. If I could go ahead, or if you want to take other questions. I'll yeah, I'll ask uh, one from the audience and then we can kind of go back and forth. Um, this person emailed a question very early in the briefing, so we'll get her, we'll get to her first. Um, this question has to do with uh, watershed management. And the question is, um, what recommendations do you have for how local communities uh, can more effectively engage in watershed management to plan for and minimize risks associated with floods and other challenges? Um, Steve, maybe we'll, we'll go to you first this time and we'll ping pong back and forth between you and Dick. So as you saw from one of my slides, we're doing watershed wide studies because we all know that floods don't stop at city limit lines. So that's why we're doing our studies based off uh, natural boundaries rather than political boundaries. We also have a program in the state of Kansas uh, where we've got watershed districts that are authorized and they can create local taxable districts and those watershed districts build dams for both water recharge, flood control, recreation, and water supply purposes. And, and that's the kind of thing you do in rural areas. You can also do watershed studies in an urban area because those, those people have this, the urban flood risk, but we're concentrating on, on rural right now. And uh, okay, so like... Yeah, I would, I, would, uh, I would add to that. I think, um, so having studies that kind of map out the resource base are really important to show the connectivity between areas. And it's very much the case that urban flooding starts in rural settings um, where the, if stormwater isn't well managed up high in the watershed, um, that can have really exacerbate the impacts, make, make you know, really complicate management downstream. So. So again, the technical hard skills are having good data <clears throat> and studies to kind of map out what's going on here and what are the relationship. The soft skills are trying to figure out how you can get communities to start working together and to recognize that what they do might have an effect on the neighboring jurisdiction and do that through watershed councils. I'm a, I'm a member of the Huron River Watershed Council here in mid-Michigan. Um, and trying to cultivate awareness of folks and look for opportunities to collaborate. And sometimes that maybe means starting small 
and getting folks to realize, hey, we can all be better off if we work together on some of these issues. So look for small wins and try and get that larger perspective and get folks to work together. And then the final thing I'll say is to, um, um, I'm gonna shoot a little bit at the National Flood Insurance Program. For a long time, um, there's been a real emphasis on um, uh, rest restoration after storms hit. So, so there is the CRS, the Community Rating System Program, and, and NFIP, and the idea is we should get communities to better manage to keep people out of floodplains and such. It hasn't worked that well as it could be. At the same time, we're subsidizing insurance for folks who are building in places that maybe aren't the safest place to build. So the NFIP program has been pretty harshly critiqued by some researchers who say that's made it worse. It's made it worse. We're not really doing good hazard management, but we're subsidizing insurance so people are building where they wouldn't otherwise build. And then when you build dams, kind of like the Edenville Dam, people get a sense that, hey, the dam's there, we've solved the problem, we can build below it. But when that dam fails, the, the damage you see is way worse coming out of it. So, so kind of making sure that as we adopt government policies that are designed to do good, that we don't kind of bake in by accident what I would call perverse policy incentives, that you actually encourage people to do exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do. And, and once, you, once people build, it's way harder to get them to move out of harm's way than it is to tell people don't build in harm's way in the first place. So we need to both kind of make sure we're not making it worse with how we develop from a watershed perspective, recognizing it's all connected, and then find places that are gonna be repetitively flooded with climate change. Maybe it's time to figure out how we can help folks move out of harm's way. There's no easy answer here, by the way. Nothing about this is easy. And pretty much whatever you propose will make somebody unhappy. So we need to kind of just figure out how we can do a better job of collectively working through this together. Ellen, we'll go back to you for the next question. Oh, sorry, Steve, please feel free to uh, jump back in. Mentioned Richard, that those insurance subsidies did exist, but they are slowly going away and they're being taken away in stair-step increments right now. Uh, so they're pulling the Band-Aid off slow because when you try to raise the rates to the full actuarial rates all in one shot, that's pretty painful for people. And again, rural, rural economies, people have to be able to adjust for that higher payment. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, that's, I know that's, that's been taking place, yep. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's not easy, but at least the conversation has to happen. So this is, this is important. Um, so it's good to raise this. And I know that for, for those watching who are, um, you know, congressional staff, I know that there's, there's uh, a real interest, has been a lot of momentum um, in past years of, of uh, updating NFIP. And um, so I, uh, I hope they hear your concerns um, and make that a priority. Um, uh, so Dan, um, I also had a question, I guess just thinking about, we've talked a lot about these sort of nature-based solutions, natural infrastructure. Um, are there specific projects? Richard, you mentioned we need to, to learn to live with nature and it's, you know, it's hard to control nature. Um, uh, so recognizing that we have, of course, uh, crumbling infrastructure like dams that we, we need to fix. Are there also some, some natural infrastructure, nature-based solutions for resilience that, um, that you're looking at or, or Steve, um, that you guys are looking at for your communities? I'll, um, I'll say a few things and I bet Steve has more too. The, in, in more urban settings, there's a really big push on green infrastructure, so-called green infrastructure, low impact development infrastructure. So instead of having a curb and gutter that takes the water just as quickly as you can possibly move it into the storm drain out to the river, um, let's build uh, rain gardens and swales where the, the water is reconnected into um, the natural landscape and infiltrates down. So there's some kind of aesthetic concerns here. When we've seen, I've had colleagues who have studied um, rain gardens and tree lawns and people don't like it. They wanna see a clean curb and a, and a tree lawn. But in fact, if we're gonna manage water better and try and better solve the flooding problem, we need to kind of go back to those natural landscapes. So uh, impervious, or impervious parking lots, 
lots, whales in parking lots that collect the runoff off the parking lot into that drain system and filter it and control it instead of shunting it as quickly as possible out to the watercourse. Those are the kinds of natural features. Um, in inland lakes, you can do, instead of building a hardened seawall, you know, plant a lot of vegetation and, and um, uh, more natural systems that will better absorb wave energy. Um, uh, than trying to just fight off nature. It's a little bit harder on the Great Lakes, the energy systems that there are so big. So um, living shorelines are really living and they're moving. Um, I know in out west with the kind of flooding that, that Steve experienced, there may be some limits what you can do with swales. It's, if the floodplains are just that big and the rainfalls are that dramatic, um, you may be constrained. But certainly in urban settings, there's a lot we could be doing to go back to green infrastructure that better handles stormwater. Well, Richard mentioned farming practices earlier, and, and I'm from an area where traditional row crops are king. But you can alter farming practices to rebuild healthy soil. And healthy soil allows rainwater to infiltrate into the soil. You, you would be amazed how much, how many gallons of water could be absorbed into the soil just by increasing soil health. And that reduces the runoff, which causes flooding. It increases the, the soil moisture, so you're more drought resistant. It makes healthier plants. You get less sediment. If there's fertilizer that's on top of the soil and that runs off, then that pollutes local water supply systems. I, I'm a big advocate for healthy soils. And, and it's a shame that when I go to flood conferences, I hear all of the traditional NFIP solutions and nobody's talking about farming practices and soils. Uh, cover crops will help reduce erosion and help add carbon back into the soil when you till those back in. Those are the kind of, Steve, I want to just build on that. When I mentioned landscape smart policies and no regrets policies, that's exactly it. You don't have to get all caught up in the debate about climate change to recognize there's a lot you could be doing to improve farming by doing exactly the things that Steve just described, that if climate change doesn't turn out to be as bad as we thought, we're still doing a better job of farming. <laughs> we're still doing a better job of cultivating and stewarding the, 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 the landscape. So, um, so it's part of the problem with our political dialogue right now is we get caught up in all these debates about da 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 da. Well, kind of get over that and think about those really good examples that Steve just mentioned about how to make farming work better and to improve the farmland. And it, oh, by the way, that's going to really reduce the amount of stormwater flowing off the land and create and exhaust, you know, making flooding problems worse. That's yeah. The na nature-based solutions are the the more yeah. It's it's a line of thinking that it, it sounds so intuitive and it, every when you, when we talk to experts like this on our briefings it's one of the things that everyone talks about but for some reason there's a disconnect there and people are you know whether it's public whether it's acceptance of them or if there's a maybe there's an assumption that they're less effective but um all of our panelists it seems are come out pretty strongly in support of improved or increased use of nature-based solutions um, from an environmental and sustainability, but also from a common sense perspective. And also um, from the cost uh, perspective, yeah. I think finding that it can be actually uh, more cost effective to do that. Yeah. So yeah, um, it, it, it also, um, I also wonder, and Steve, you reminded me of this in terms of farming practices. I assume the ag extension programs are talking about this um, and yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. so, so yeah. The, the NRCS the USDA yeah sure they, they promote soil health absolutely yeah right Up, upper strips at the edge of field, farm fields but but then I've got the guys that you farm fence row to fence row and you knock the fence over and go a little on the neighbor's property too <laughs> Temporarily move the fence and then put it back when you're done, right? <laughs> I know what happens because I was the neighbor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, the next question uh, comes from someone in our audience, and this is a little bit more of a clarification question. It was originally sort of targeted to you, Dick, but I think there's a way to broaden it um, just to get a little bit more background. Um, and we'll start maybe with you, Dick, and then Steve, interested in what you think um, or what you know. Um, who and how are is dam regulation determined in Michigan? Who regulates the dams? Who gets to make decisions about what's regulated, what's unregulated? And then when you know, Steve, 
I, oops, sorry, uh, interested in here sort of how things are done in Kansas and sort of if there are any differences, but go ahead, Dick. Yeah, um, I, I don't know the precise details, but the, um, we have dammed a lot of our rivers in the state of Michigan and they range from very small um, uh, um, boundaries to, to really large structures. And as I understand it, the state regulates about half of them and it's primarily based on the size of the impoundment behind the the structure. So the size of the structure itself and the size of the impoundment. And when that gets big enough, I don't remember the exact acreage, but when it gets big enough where I think if it fails, there could be real damage, that's when the state steps in and takes on a regulatory role. All right. So, so dams are, admin, are monitored in the state of Kansas. We have, we have state statutes on this. And we have a dam safety program at the Water Structures Program in the Division of Water Resources under the Kansas Department of Agriculture. The man who runs that program is also my boss. So I'm not gonna give you the exact statistics because I'd probably get them wrong and I'd be in big trouble with it. But the way they determine what a high hazard dam is, is by looking at the height of the dam as measured at the emergency spillway and how many acre feet of water are impounded behind it. And essentially, how big is the lake behind the dam? Uh, okay, thanks. And thanks for that clarification. What would be affected by a dam breach to determine if it's a high hazard dam or not. Because a big dam that has okay. nothing below it, it's not a high hazard dam. Mm -hmm. So but that's, generally they're, they're regulated or controlled by the state though, as opposed to local or, or sort of, you know, sort of intrastate regional entities. I think they're generally locally regulated by the state. The dam that failed mm -hmm. in Midland, the Edenville Dam was also subject to Permitting by the uh, FERC, the Federal Emergency Regulatory Commission, Energy mm -hmm. Regulatory Commission, because it was a hydro dam. Um, so there's a bit of controversy about that dam. They, FERC withdrew its permission to make hydro because they were very concerned about the safety of the dam. And they've been really working hard on the dam owners to um, take needed repairs. And the state was going back and forth with them too, and it wasn't happening. Um, so the, it's the size of the dam, the structure that dictates whether or not the state's going to pick up and regulate it. Um, and then how much, how many resources the state puts towards that effort is a function of how many resources the state has to work with and their allocation of resources across all of their different programs. And, and we're not allocating very much. Um, they're really relying heavily on dam owners doing their own inspections and submitting them to the inspectors to read and sign off on, but quite often the inspectors don't have the capacity to actually go out and look at the dam. That's my understanding from reading news reports. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have time for one last question uh, before we wrap up. Uh, and I'm gonna try to bring it around to sort of the outbreak, the coronavirus, sort of the context for all of our briefing series. And um, you, the both of you think about flooding uh, mitigating flood risk. You think about this all the time. Um, from where you're sitting, um, what are you most concerned about from a public health, sort of the intersection between public health and flood and dam safety, flood risk perspective? Are there things that you're sort of really on the lookout for? Are there issues that you think that, um, that you're really nervous or that you're really on the watch for? Um, or are there... Um, um, are, sort of what are your main concerns as, I mean, none of us hope, of course, that the coronavirus spreads, but um, if it does over the summer and if there's risk of flooding, what, what are your chief concerns about sort of that intersection of, of natural disasters and public health disasters? So, so this year it's looking a little easier for me than last year did. Last year was, was terrible on the flooding and all the rain we got. This year's going a little better. If this year was like last year, my concern would be people who have to evacuate from a flood. Not necessarily going to the center, but they just can't go back home. Uh, so now I've got a mobile population. With a mobile population, they're moving around and that brings them in contact with other people. So that's kind of how I would be concerned about how the coronavirus would interact with flooding in a situation like that. We didn't activate very many shelters last year. N nothing like that where people having to stay in shelters, but a lot of people went to hotels and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, same thing here. Um, the thing that we're seeing is that we're getting wetter. We're, we're going to very likely, uh, almost undoubtedly, see bigger storms, wetter storms, more frequent 
and severe storms are going to just keep happening. And COVID-19 has um, just sucked the energy out of everything to deal with but COVID-19. So a lot of, and it's made it really hard for government to function when you can't have public hearings and meetings and get together and keep things going. And you can only do Zoom so much. <laughs> so um, it's the increased frequency of storms had me concerned. And, and then beyond that, I, I think um, just um, our, most of the problems we're dealing with, it's really easy to think, oh, that happened in Midland. Or now for the Midland folks to think, well, it happened now, it's not gonna happen for another 500 years. And that's probably not the case. We're probably gonna see more storms. And we still have all of these disconnects that are preventing us from seeing how things piece together and thinking carefully about how do we start planning for that. And COVID-19 is just making it so much harder to give it the attention it needs because we're so distracted with having to deal, you know, understandably so, to deal with those public health concerns, but it just adds to the challenge that much more. Um, well, you said, oh, go ahead, Steve, please have the last word. Uh, what I've seen, the studies I've read, eastern Kansas is going to get about two more inches per rain per year. Western Kansas might get about two inches less. The middle of the state's going to stay about the same. The dry line's moving about 140 miles to the east. That's the sort of the front range for tornadoes. Now, the deal is, though, that even when the places where the rainfall stays the same, the storms will come less frequently and be more intense. And I'm already seeing that happen. Yep, that's yeah. happening here too. So we have to deal with drought and storms at the same time. It's, it's, it's a bit ironic how this is playing out. Hmm. Uh, well, thank you very much. And Dick, you said you can't do everything by Zoom, but I hope present company is accepted from that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too much of a dig at the end of our briefing series on your. No, part. no, not at all. Didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's you know doing these online. You know we do kind of miss out for sure on the um, on the in person you know aspect of it. But um, you know it's it's wonderful when we're able to bring panelists together like you and Steve uh, to to sort of provide perspective on a topic. And um, at some point maybe we'll be able to do sort of a follow-up briefing on some of these issues, um, hopefully at a time when we can get together and, um, and not be remote and, um, and, and have an opportunity to meet and shake hands and all that. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days and joining us today and educating our audience about these issues. Um, I'd like to thank Ellen uh, and Omri and Dan O'Brien and everyone um, on Team EESI for all of their help with this week. Um, if anyone has missed, um, uh, any of the briefings that we've done this week, the three of them, uh, visit www.esi.org. Um, there are archived webcasts as well as presentation materials. Uh, while you're there, um, I encourage everyone to sign up for Climate Change Solutions. It's a great newsletter. It comes out every other Tuesday. But please also, if you're there, please take a moment to fill out our survey. Um, we pay a lot of attention to the feedback that we receive on these briefings, and um, your, your responses really help us do a better job. And, um, sort of consider what to do differently. And um, we're going to be online for some time. And so there may be other things that we can experiment with to make our online briefing offerings more attractive to you. So if you have a moment, it means a lot when, when people fill out the survey. And thanks to those who have already done it. We're going to go ahead and end there. Apologies for being a couple minutes over. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you for watching uh, from wherever you are. And um, please stay tuned for our next uh, briefings, whenever they may be. Um, and uh, in the meantime, take care, everyone, and hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.